Good afternoon and welcome all those people that are on the line. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us here for the PHO and Sci-Fi Ontario seminar series. Uh, my name is Eric Devine. I'm representing Sci-Fi Ontario Executive. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Peter Pitt and James Anderson uh, for joining us today. We're going to talk about the uh, misperceptions. Let's take the myth theory out of mold. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Um, we will remain in lecture mode for the duration of this call. Um, Peter and James will go through their presentation and we'll do uh, Q&A afterwards. Um, briefly, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Peter and James. Um, Peter's worked extensively in occupational hygiene and environmental health consulting for the last 30 plus years, uh, dealing with a wide range of issues from air contamination to sick buildings, exposure to toxic substances, inhalation diseases, worker illness investigations, and so on. He's also the techn technical director of an ISO 17025 certified laboratory operated by OSHTEC. In recent years, Peter has conducted a number of research studies on mold exposure, which have been published and presented to medical, engineering, and scientific audiences. Peter and his colleague Jim have been invited by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology on a number of occasions to present seminars dealing with misperceptions about mold. Uh, Jim is a specialist in environmental allergies and aerobiology. He has been in private practice working with OSHTEC for the last several years, but his career included several years of work in the clinical and research environment. Among other things, Jim is certified by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology for enumeration of pollens and molds. Um, there he is an, a, a longstanding member of the Aerobiology Committee and also the group of allied health professionals. Jim has conducted many investigations of mold exposures in schools, homes, court buildings, offices, um, and the like. Jim has contributed to a number of very recent conference presentations, journal publications, educational and training seminars on the subject of mold and pollen exposures, as well as uh, impacts of climate change. Jim has been invited by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology on a number of occasions to present informative seminars for clinicians on the subject of separating fact from fiction about mold and Sci-Fi Ontario and Public Health Ontario. Um, we welcome him here today to talk about mold. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, this is Peter speaking to the audience, and I have my colleague uh, Jim with me here. Hi, I'm Jim. And we're, uh, you can tell you can tell uh, you, he's a little bit scruffier than I am, but uh, uh, we're really pleased to be here and appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, to discuss this uh, subject with you. And uh, so we've we've been introduced uh, by Eric. We thank him for that introduction, and also Stephanie for helping us through uh, uh, the early. Uh, technical glitches that we had here. So without further ado, let's uh, get on to this uh, seminar looking at these issues around uh, misperceptions related to mold. Uh, and uh, so for those of you who uh, examined what, what we were uh, going to uh, deal with here today, I'll just go over this very quickly. Uh, this is essentially the content of what, uh, what we want to deal with here. And that is the uh, subject, as we said in our uh, abstract, for this uh, session is the, the, the subject of mold exposure is highly controversial and it's poorly understood. And there's a lot of misperceptions around it, uh, uh, around molds. Uh, there are many, as we say, uh, practitioners, whether that's in public health, in the medical or scientific community, uh, and especially in the general public uh, who have this kind of a um, um, feeling that mold moves in mysterious ways. And so what we are look, uh, going to look at here is that this belief uh, is not really based on fact, and it contributes to this kind of scary perception and perpetuates uh, the mythology around mold. And that's what we're going to explore, are some of the myths about toxic black mold uh, and the factors that give rise to it. And uh, we're going to differentiate uh, fact from fiction and hopefully present a balanced perspective on, on the real issues. And that's what our intent is. Uh, and that's what you, uh, those of you who uh, signed up for this will um, uh, hopefully get out of this presentation. So let's just take a look. Again, this is something that um, uh, just a high level uh, information here uh, to say this is what we want to do. Uh, the objectives, the stated objectives of this presentation. Uh, 
Um, first, we want to present the evidence that the risk of mold is often overstated or misstated or misunderstood. Uh, the second objective we have in uh, making this presentation uh, is that uh, to, to identify that there's well-established uh, clinical and scientific knowledge which contradicts the myths of toxic black mold. Uh, we want to, of course, put it in the context of the public health uh, message uh, for you and also then talk about uh, how sampling for molds and mold investigations fits into the picture. So we want to start with, these, uh, with this uh, um, often, often um, mold is, is referred to as uh, perceived as a biohazard. Toxic black mold is what you con uh, con uh, consistently hear about. And uh, what we're going to explore in this presentation is that, first of all, the term toxic is not accurate. And we will uh, explore uh, toxicity in the context of mold, but we'll find out that it's not exactly what, it's, uh, what the perceptions are. Uh, second of all, Sorry, just going to interrupt for just a second. Um, we are sending out the slide deck for those people that can't view it online. It will be arriving in your email inbox, so you can follow along the presentation there. Ah, okay. Uh, so, so we just uh, bring yourself up to speed as soon as you get it in your uh, inbox, I guess. Next thing, uh, uh, coming back to uh, toxic black mold, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we want to uh, talk about this concept or mention that black mold, well, yeah, uh, mold uh, is black, uh, and a lot of molds are black, actually. Uh, it's very common, but there's there are many different kinds of, uh, many different colors of mold. Uh, uh, black, uh, there's blue, there's green, there's pink, there's yellow. Uh, rainbow. Yeah, the ra rainbow colors, right? So black is common, uh, and uh, uh, mold, uh, what do we want to talk about mold here? is that mold is part of our natural environment, and it's found in uh, clean air and on all kinds of surfaces. So this is the kind of uh, perception that we want, to, uh, we want to create because that's at total odds with what the, uh, with what the public perception is and, some, and, and in some cases a perception amongst uh, uh, even some of this uh, professional community. So when we talk about toxic black mold, Jim's going to make a bit of a comment here because a lot of this history refers to a particular mold uh, uh, referred to as tachybotrys. Okay, well, as you can see from the slide here, back in the 30s and 40s, uh, <clears throat> starving farmers and their livestock um, uh, were reading this um, grain stored outdoors uh, without realizing that it had been infected with tachybotrys. And then when it's growing on there, it'll produce these secondary metabolites, which are the bad things, the mycotoxins. Okay, so that was way back then. Fast forward to the 90s, the famous Cleveland case, where you had a bunch of infants in a particular situation with bleeding lung, and they found statue batteries, and oh, well, the world came to an end, buildings were closed, and everybody was scared of this black toxic mold, which in fact is not, it's a dark green, it's very wet, and basically, when it's actively growing, it doesn't release the spores to any extent. Now, everybody thinks black toxic mold is making me sick, and basically that's how we got to where we are with the full subject. So that takes us into, this, or lead in uh, nicely into this uh, um, concept we want to deal with, first of all, is the misperceptions of the risks associated uh, with mold and mold exposure. and. Uh, or should I interject one thing here? Sure. On the back slide, I forgot to mention that all that's been disproved. The Cleveland case has been debunked. Okay, go on. Okay, wonderful. So, so to begin this, then, we, we want to look at what are the factors that shape this misperception. And, of course, uh, uh, one of the ones, uh, of course, that takes a beating uh, is always the, uh, is always the uh, media. And, uh, of course, in this case, it does have a... <laughs> a significant uh, role in the perception. We're talking about both the um, popular or public media form uh, for, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as social media. So we'll take a look at that. We'll talk about uh, the business of mold as another, uh, another contributor to the misperceptions. We'll look at 
uh, messages which are not consistent uh, across the board from uh, uh, from uh, trusted sources. And when I say trusted sources, I mean people who should be in the know. And finally, we want to talk a little bit about uh, how, in some cases, it's been perhaps the uh, dismissal. Uh, the science has been around for a while in terms of uh, the evidence and the principles around mold exposure, but uh, to, uh, it has, to some extent, been dismissed. And so these have all led to misperceptions, and we'll talk um, and look at that uh, now. So, so this is a, a classic uh, talking about the, uh, the public media. Um, this is, for example, a set of, uh, of uh, headlines, and these are real headlines that, uh, that uh, were found uh, in, uh, in newspapers, uh, uh, things like fatal fungus, Death of innocence in, in search of a killer, mold drives family from home, uh, and there's countless, countless, countless uh, types of uh, um, articles like that. So you can so you can see that if you're uh, in public, you're like this little guy sitting there scratching your head. It really makes you wonder, uh, and of course, there it creates uncertainty. So uh, um, so this so this has been a significant contributor to. Uh, um, to the problem, and Jim wants to talk a bit on this. Uh, now, this is another big case here. I think it was statue that they found in this person's wonderful mansion. You can see in the background how everything looks so pristine, and they're wearing these hazmat suits. The source of all this mold damage, well, it doesn't look too moldy to me. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the courts in the U.S., oh, okay, well, we'll just throw money at mold, it's bad, oh, you know, it's all terrible. Well, then on appeal, it was dropped down to, she got, I think, a million dollars to um, fix the house, fix the mold problem, and, and that was it. And basically, that's all it was, you know. So she had mold growing in her house, picked it up, and everything's hunky-dory. But the initially, But course, that was a big deal. Yeah. Know, almost like the Cleveland case, you know. And there are many, many other stories of, 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 of relatively uh, important uh, sport figures. Others who have been in the headlines, uh, who have co been connected with mold issues, and uh, uh, I think there's Ed McMahon. There is um, uh, some of those dogs yeah. right? supposed to have died of cancer from mold. It's some weird story. So, so there's lots of different mm -hmm. stories like this, yeah. and that's what we're saying is that if you're if you're listening to this kind of stuff or reading this stuff, taking it in, of course you're going to you're going to uh, uh, have uh, create some doubts and some uncertainty and uh, and create apprehensions and that's on the on the on the public media side and and uh, we also wanted to uh, present just a little bit of the perceptions that are created around uh, uh, the internet and the internet diagnosis that uh, uh, that occurs and uh, so, so for example if you go to muzzle.com here they talk about uh, symptoms of black mold poisoning. Uh, and that poisoning occurs when a person is exposed to mycotoxins produced by toxic black mold species. Uh, and, uh, and then it talks about the severity of the toxic black mold poisoning. Uh, and and it, if you read further down, uh, some of the common symptoms of black mold poisoning, uh, difficulty in breathing, uh, vision, ringing ears, hearing loss, uh, dirt-like taste, uh, chronic fatigue, headache, dizziness, hair loss, and it goes on and on and on and on. Parkinson's supposed to be in there too somewhere. Uh, it it uh, you it, know, it, Parkinson's in there. <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, so 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 uh, uh, the problem with this is that when people access this information, they do not differentiate what is reliable and unreliable information, and uh, this cre this uh, contributes to their understanding of what uh, what is the mold. So that's one source. There's another one. If you look at uh, Canada mold test kits, for example, uh, they talk, again, uh, the falling health problems associated with toxic mold. Uh, um, allergies, yes, we're going to talk about that. Uh, but arthritic-like aches, uh, they go on to talk about bloody noses, uh, um, depression, stuffiness, epileptic-type seizures. Um, balance loss, uh, and all of these kinds of claims uh, are, are made 
around uh, exposure to mold. And uh, uh, we hope that by the end of this presentation, you're not going to take those too seriously. And most of you, I'm sure, don't already. But it does help uh, reiterate why, why there is sometimes this misperception. Uh, and uh, uh, also um, on the bottom there, moldhelp.org, where they, um, and I, I've only taken, uh, selectively lift, lifted a couple of, uh, um, a couple of articles just to, uh, just There are to, many, many, uh, many more. And, and in fact, uh, I'll, I'll get to a slide here that discusses that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you, you can see that there's claims around, uh, uh, the the effects of mold, and they're simply not they're simply not true. That's the long and short of it. Uh, and what uh, what I'm presenting to you here is actually uh, uh, a little bit of a study we did. Uh, oh, I'm going to say a half a dozen years ago or yeah. so. And what we wanted to do was get uh, and and pair up the perceptions of mold from the public side in the perceptions of mold from the professional side. And uh, so, so uh, we did a um, search of what, what was the internet di you know, diagnosis for the mold exposures? What, what did people believe happened? Uh, you know, what were the consequences if you were exposed to mold? And uh, so on the, on the left panel, what we've identified is simply the, the uh, the five most common um, beliefs associated with mold exposure. Uh, the, most people in the public and from our survey uh, thought that, uh, uh, that, that you could die from mold exposure. And that, uh, that the uh, next uh, second loss or the uh, going down the, down the uh, down the uh, list of, uh, of um, perceived health effects, uh, restlessness, loss of eyesight, cancer, and seizures were all on the top, uh, all on the top, um, the, the top five uh, beliefs that um, that mold exposure caused these kinds of uh, uh, Ill, Ill health effects, um, and. Um, so that's what I've exploded on the on the right uh, on the uh, sorry on the left panel at the top, on the bottom panel uh, to the right of this slide. Uh, what we've done is we then said, okay, well, what is the actual belief amongst the um, uh, scientific and medical community? And we and we um, looked at and did a um, review of uh, PubMed. Um, with with the, with the same uh, with the same uh, yeah with the same input as Google, and uh, so what we uh, what we uh, noticed and what you can barely detect is that uh, when we looked at what health professionals thought, uh, there was no nobody who had looked at or even gave any consideration to the thought of uh, of death from mold or restlessness or eyesight or seizures. Uh, there, uh, and um, those are the, the, the five largest bars that you see in this multi-populated uh, graph on the right side. Uh, those are the those are the same ones that I've uh, that were on the, on the pub on the um, Google search. And what you can barely detect is on the top of a few of these bars is a little tiny tiny little red spot. And that red spot is actually uh, we've amplified it just to just to demonstrate that yes, there was some interest in the medical community or some exploration from the medical com community around uh, around the issues. Um, uh, and in the, the one I particularly circled is the one that, that refers to uh, cancer. And I suspect a lot of the association and interest there was in, in relation to research money. But uh, um, for the most part, the medical community has a very, very different uh, uh, perspective uh, than than the uh, um, than a, than a public, and this this uh, leads to some very uh, difficult situations to manage. 
And as part of that, uh, both Jim and myself have been involved quite a lot uh, over the last number of years in, uh, in um, similar types of uh, uh, presentations and trying to assist uh, clinicians, uh, physicians and specialists in, in trying to um, address with their uh, patients about how do you deal with these kinds of perceptions. So let's, let's talk about then, uh, let's talk about what, uh, what contributes to the, uh, uh, further contributes to the uh, uh, misperceptions about mold. Here you have my uh, merchant of mold, and uh, this is a business. Uh, <clears throat> we didn't realize how big it was until we did some internet search, and as you can see from the slide, they've got everything covered. They look at this as a money-making business, uh, uh, as you can read there in the next slide, which is, and they, they even have, you know, these schools to develop your skills in the business of mold. So there, and they cover everything. Yeah, it's amazing. So there's mold. Give them that. Yeah. Give them that. You know, we're looking to make money here, and mold is a good way to make money. And, and because of that, of course, this this uh, this is in your face all the time, contributing. So as Jim says, there's everything from mold certification courses to training, inspection, remediation, testing, mold career planning. Yes, and mold marketing. Of course, you know they're feeding the internet too. This is they're helping along. So uh, here is a very, 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 very short list of some of the mold schools, and uh, uh, and we're not we're not passing judgment here, and we're not we're just talking. Yeah, we're out there. yeah, and some of these are are very uh, what I would say uh, are uh, very uh, helpful organizations. Some of them are uh, out there to uh, contribute to the misperception. Uh, if you create, contribute to uncertainty, you can uh, exploit that situation. Uh, but uh, uh, we're not saying that because you're on this list that you're a bad guy or a good guy, okay? Just keep that in mind. We're just saying that there are several different uh, organizations that uh, uh, offer uh, some type of uh, mold schooling. Let's just call it that. Okay, so we want to really move in and, and uh, move away from uh, discussion of the perceptions to this. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what perceptions are around the health effects. Now we really want to talk about what are the real health effects. Now, basically what you see there is the three main ones. Allergies, allergic states, not just hay fever kind of allergy, you'll see, <clears throat> and the toxicity and infection. And the other three things you have to really remember is how do we get exposed to this mold thing. So really the number one is the inhalation of fungal material contained in bioaerosols. In other words, you're breathing in mold spores, but we'll get to that. You eat you know, mold directly or which may contain their metabolic products. Back to from Russia with love, that's exactly what happened. They ate the moldy grain, they got some bad health effects. And then dermal contact, okay, we know, we're just as a matter of fact, that happened with the horses back in Russia. They, from eating this grain, they got the dermatitis around their mouth. Yeah, it, it's just fascinating. Uh, specifically on the allergic states, well, we'll get to that, but uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, this is a major player. Okay. What? So. And it is these states you can see that these. The three top ones on the left and the three top, the two on the <clears throat> right are allergic states. So, so we're talking about uh, here as the, as the um, really the, the disease states associated with, uh, with mold exposure, uh, many uh, allergic type symptoms uh, uh, like hay fever and, uh, and asthma, so rhinitis, asthma, uh, Acute bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or mycosis. Mycosis can be more than aspergillosis, yes, definitely. Right. Right. Hypersensitive pneumon, I commonly call it farmer's lung. Right. That was the biggie kind of thing, but you can get it from other than moldy hay. Right, and a fungal sinusitis that if it lands in your nose. Yeah, fungi, and you don't clear it out properly, and then yeah, it's not a major thing, but. Yeah. So, so so we'll look at we'll look at uh, some of these uh, we'll look at some of these. And of course, the toxicity thing is the one that everybody's scared about. 
the, and we're going to explore. We're going to explore this concept of, uh, of uh, the uh, toxicity of molds. Um, but the, the important thing to draw from this message is that 99% of mold effects are of an allergic, allergic nature. One allergic. of the allergic states that, right. that is, is, is allergy. Yes. And when we talk about allergy, there is also a component of specificity to the allergy. You, you, um, people are allergic uh, to um, uh, a type of mold. There may be some crop sensitivity, but you're not allergic to all mold. And just like you're not allergic to all pollen, you may be allergic to a specific tree in the spring, but not all trees. Basically, the same works here. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, uh, what, we, uh, what we want to summarize this uh, section by saying, and this is a quote from the Center for Disease Control, is that uh, molds themselves are not toxic or poisonous, but some produce mycotoxins. And the common health concerns include hay fever, as I said, allergy symptoms. It's the people who, have, uh, who are immunocompromised really that are at risk of, uh, of, the, uh, of the infection. Yeah. And uh, for the rest of us, no. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the allergic state that, uh, that uh, for 99% for, for of all cases, that's, that's what we're looking and at. And if asthmatic have a problem with mold, that's a real problem. So in here we say that molds are not toxic or poisonous, but some produce mycotoxins. And that's kind of my segue into talking about, uh, about uh, mycotoxins, okay? So what are mycotoxins? Well, mycotoxins are basically, uh, they're the metabolites that when mold is uh, eating away on uh, on uh, organic matter, it's uh, digesting the organic matter, producing metabolites, and these are uh, these are uh, large molecules, okay, uh, which means they're not volatile, and that's very important because you can't breathe in you're not, mycotoxins; they're not floating around in the air, not freely, yeah. not freely, no, and we'll and we'll talk a little not bit by about themselves, right? So we'll. We'll explore that. So, uh, just a couple of points here in, in regards to the uh, mycotoxins. One is that uh, uh, a single mold type can produce uh, many different types of mycotoxins. Under the right conditions, again. Sometimes um, many molds can produce also the same type of mycotoxin. And thirdly, that mycotoxins are not always produced. And so I give you, want to give you a couple of examples here of the common molds that produce mycotoxins. Um, um, so we, here we've got uh, one that probably many of you uh, in, in public health are familiar with is aflatoxin. Um, from, uh, uh, and uh, the, one, the, uh, the, uh, the one that we want to uh, relate to is, uh, is the uh, trichothecene. Um, this is uh, wh why I mentioned the trichothecenes uh, specifically as a uh, family of mycotoxins. It's a very, very large family uh, consisting of more than a hundred different uh, compounds, but it's also the uh, group of mycotoxins that was associated with Stachybotrys. And Stachybotrys uh, is this, uh, when we talk about toxic black mold, Stachybotrys and toxic black mold have really been bandied about as a, as a synonym yes. and used uh, um, casually in the same context. But there, but uh, and th that's why that's why it's specific reference here to Stachybotrys. But we we're trying to tell you that many molds look the same as that, and they're not going to necessarily be Stachybotrys. Uh, the, so one of the other uh, um, points to draw your attention to here is alternaria. Alternarias are is a very big uh, allergen in, in, uh, in, in terms of molds. It's, it's, uh, the allergist will tell you that it's their it, major mold allergen, basically. Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, so and from alternaria, we can find that there's 125 or so uh, um, different uh, metabolites, and approximately, uh, from what I understand, 
approximately a quarter of those would be considered mycotoxic. And this, incidentally, is not our information. I want to credit Bruce Kelman with this uh, information. It's his information. <laughs> and uh, um, what I also want to do is uh, show you something that he did. Uh, which now, this is, is the fun part, kids. Pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention. So this is, a, this is an interesting um, calculation that, that uh, uh, Bruce did. And uh, what he did was he asked the question, how many molt spores, uh, molt spores, uh, in other words, contamination of the air, molt spores per cubic meter, are required for a human inhaled dose of mycotoxin um, uh, to equal a dose of spores that had effects in animals. In other words, uh, what he did was he looked at the no effect level in animals, and he said, okay, uh, this is the no effect level uh, which we use to try to predict uh, um, and develop our dose response relationships and so on if you're trying to build a case for, for, for uh, looking at these, uh, uh, the, t the toxic effect. So this is really a case of inhalation versus ingestion, isn't it? No. Or, how, how much you, or strictly well, inhalation? Well, well, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, um, it's essentially what, uh, what, what um, Bruce said was, um, okay, how many, the, the long and short of this question is how many mold spores does it take uh, before you have a toxic effect. Yeah. And this is what this uh, calculation is around. So what he did was he went back to, uh, apparently the uh, Environmental Protection Agency has a uh, exposure factors uh, in which you can, uh, in which they have said, okay, how, how much air does an infant of one month old breathe? And how much air does a six year old child or an adult breathe? And, and you can calculate this uh, based on um, based on the number of breaths and the size of the lungs, uh, and uh, you can uh, estimate uh, what, uh, what um, amount of air, the cubic meters of air, that uh, e um, these uh, individuals would have, would have uh, inhaled in, in a day. And so he used those, uh, and EPA then uh, says that a child of uh, one month um, inhales 4.5 cubic meters of air, a day, a six-year-old child is about 10, and an adult up to 15.2 cubic meters of air. And so they said, okay, well, let's take our no-effect published information from the animals and try to calculate backwards what would be the equivalent spore concentration. So what they did was they dosed up um, animals, uh, rats or mice, uh, and uh, and then with with uh, with and they and I'm going to point out that they dosed them. Uh, uh, with um, uh, by implanting the uh, the um, the um, stachyboxers uh, directly into the trachea or into the nose, so that you've got maximum uh, uh, um, maximum uh, uh, toxin uh, contact, uh, and um, and so they went through this and they said, okay, well, uh, if we we if we've delivered a certain dose. Uh, of uh, spores uh, per kilogram of this animal, and we look at the weight of the animal, and uh, and then we know uh, how much the uh, volume of air uh, was inhaled and the duration, and then uh, you can calculate the equivalent airborne uh, concentration in terms of spores per cubic meter of air that, that w this mycotoxin dose would be related to. Uh, and long and short of it is, if you go, you'll see that the kilograms uh, um, cancel out and, the, uh, and that the uh, days cancel out, and this is why you come up with the spores per cubic meter. In any event, so he took this information and said, okay, we know what uh, the no effect level is in animals. Uh, and we calculated back to say what would be the, the no effect, uh, le the no effect level. So he's saying this is no effect in animals. Uh, and so if uh, so they looked at this and they said, okay, if we know that, uh, that this child or the infant is breathing 4.5 cubic meters of air per day, with this dose that we delivered, how much dose would be in that, in that air? And they, and they calculated that uh, over a 24-hour period, that steadily over 24-hour periods, 
that an infant of uh, one month old would have to be breathing uh, over two million spores per cubic meter of air over an entire 24-hour period, uh, and this would still be considered the no-effect level in the animal. And the adult was somewhere up around, uh, up around uh, 15 uh, million uh, spores per cubic meter. Uh, and they, at those levels, they still saw no effect, no toxic effect, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, this is when they dosed animals for a, a continuous day. And if you look at a single bolus, uh, that being uh, where somebody's walked into a cloud of, let's say, a cloud of uh, mold, uh, stachybotrys, uh, with, uh, with, of course, with the, uh, with the, uh, um, Toxin is that the, the levels are uh, in in the billions of spores per cubic meter of air, uh, to which uh, they would still expect a no effect level, no effect toxic level. Okay. Uh, now, uh, and I also have to mention to you that they base this on uh, infiltrate, uh, as I mentioned, deposition directly in the animals. If you do inhalation studies, you've got to remember that. Uh, uh, on, on inhalation, um, that not everything that you breathe in stays in, and in fact, the, the exchange uh, is not all that uh, is not all that efficient. Uh, most of what you breathe in, you actually breathe out on your next breath. Uh, so, the, the, the point here being that you need a whole lot of uh, microtoxin. Uh, and in, well, in well, one more thing, um, besides the secondary metabolites, microtoxins. Uh, the toxin is also contained in the spores that you can breathe. So that's why they went through that exercise to see how much it would take, yeah. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. That's almost like, I'm sure it has to be like a piece of fog of spores in the air that you'd be breathing. Right. So so his, his basic conclusion, uh, and it's not just his, but in a, in a typical mold-contaminated mold office or uh, residence, it's virtually impossible to inhale sufficient mycotoxin. Okay, so this we want to we want to mention that because the the big the perception is the toxic effect, and there's it's virtually impossible. And, uh, and second of all, that the current scientific evidence just doesn't support this proposition that human health can be uh, adversely affected by mycotoxins in, in a home, uh, school, or office environment. And what I provided here. And Jim and I have provided is a few different references, uh, reliable references that um, you can look at uh, that go into this and explore it in much more detail. But uh, we're just presenting uh, the tip of some of the information here. Well, this all relates back to the from Marshall, from Marshall with Love slide and the Cleveland case. So that shows you right there that it's impossible for those infants to be breathing. There weren't enough spores there to start with. Uh, to have any Ill, Ill, Ill effect from the breathing, it's just not possible. And Jim wants to talk to you a little bit about, of course, we're not saying that, that, uh, that mycotoxins aren't nasty. Uh, and of course, those of you in public health know that that's not true. Uh, but but uh, uh, Jim, we'll, we will, we've, we've pared down the slides. We have a lot of other information on this, but uh, Jim just wants to, wants to present a little bit about, uh, about uh, mycotoxins in the context of uh, agricultural exposure. Well, this is where the most important uh, mycotoxic effect is in crops. And, and any infected crops that the livestock might be fed. And uh, so uh, I believe that these, these mycotoxins, these crops are always monitored for the presence of mycotoxins before they get to market and stuff like that. But this is where they like to grow because we got organic stuff, we got the Corn is grown, it's on way dying, okay, and it's already got some, so it can easily be infected by, not only by rust and smuts, but also by other friendly molds like statue batteries and uh, whatever. Um, so it just, there's so many crops that it can grow on, as you can see there. Um, and uh, Aspergillus, again, Penicillium, Fusarium, Alternaria, Friend Alternaria, and statue batteries. I mean, it's just, I mean, mold is all dark. That's where it's already, and it just will try and grow on anything. And if it's the right stuff, it may or may not produce mycotoxins, but uh, 
science knows this, so they, they monitor any toxic effect in, in crops. And, and livestock can get, as you see, in trouble there too. So. Okay, well, I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, we've covered uh, the, the aspect of, uh, of uh, toxicity in mycotoxins. Uh, which is one of the questions that come uh, come up. Uh, um, the other the other one that people have often received questions about is if in relation to molds is is uh, uh, around the VOCs or the volatile organic compounds. Uh, and and so so people people ask questions if it's not about the spores, then you ask about the toxic effect, or they talk about what uh, what else can uh, can molds do. And of course, uh, molds, uh, they, they do uh, produce uh, volatile organic compounds, and we refer to them as MVOCs, meaning microbiologically derived volatiles. And uh, uh, this is, what, of course, what gives the, what, the odor um, um, from, from molds. But this is not, this is not uh, toxin, okay? This is a quite different than, than uh, than uh, the, the mycotoxins, which are uh, large uh, molecules that we're talking here of much smaller molecules, which are uh, volatile and can get into the air. And this includes a very, uh, so when, when molds are growing happily and metabolizing, um, they, they can produce uh, VOCs and, and do produce VOCs, and this is, includes a very wide range of different types of um, common uh, compounds. You can see the, um, listed here the range of everything from, and these are big families, alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, um, terpenes, uh, when we say sulfur and nitrogen. The, these are very big uh, um, this is like a catch-all phrase for, 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 for chemicals, uh, any of the lightweight uh, compounds uh, <laughs> we, can, we can see. Well, the, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, from a hygiene perspective is that with many VOCs, uh, we, uh, we tend to look at this from, a, from an industrial perspective and look at exposure. So we know that there are irritant effects that have been established for VOCs. What is um, intriguing uh, for many of us is that uh, is that in, in the damp buildings um, where we where we uh, find mold growth is that uh, uh, yes we can smell it but what we find is that uh, is that uh, uh, the, the VOC levels are very 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 low uh, they're in the nanogram range um, to let's say uh, maybe microgram uh, but they're far, far lower than what we have uh, um, seen the toxic, or I should say, irritant effects in in industry. So it it causes us some pause when we when we realize that yeah, we know that we can smell it, we can detect it, uh, these VOCs um, because they are they're volatile and they off gas, uh, but. Uh, the, the, the levels at which we're finding them is really inconsistent with what we uh, what we see in dose effect relationships, and so it causes us to question about uh, yes uh, again uh, it leads to perceptions that yes we can perceive the VOCs and we know there's a smell there, but is the, is it the are the VOCs causing the problem? Not likely. Uh, one of the things that we also want to point out is that the VOCs which are eliminated from, uh, from uh, molds uh, are very, they're very similar to all of the other VOCs that are already in the home. And these are things uh, that are derived from cleaning uh, products, uh, from cooking, um, any of these types of uh, activities in the home release similar VOCs and I would suspect in much higher levels. Uh, but uh, these, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they contribute to the perceptions that mold is growing, and uh, and if we're going to use VOCs, we need to look at better markers, because uh, the the um, um, 
these are very common uh, substances, and uh, to try to differentiate what is due to a mold and due to the uh, to the home environment is virtually impossible. Um, so just just a point then that uh, that uh, uh, as I mentioned, they're very very low odor thresholds. They're easily detectable, and this is what what we ascribe to molds as that musty smell or that earthy smell. Sometimes people refer to, depending, I suppose, um, uh, what type of mold, dirty socks. I haven't, uh, I haven't smelled that one myself, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but these are the types of descriptions that we get when, when people detect molds. And of course, this is what, uh, what happens. Uh, here is a picture of a dog, and we know dogs have wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, detection apparatus. Uh, in the nose, uh, and in this particular case, this dog is sniffing out truffles. Uh, truffles, according to Jim, uh, the world's most expensive food. And, and That was the happy video thing. Yeah. Uh, so, and you've probably seen, you've probably seen that they've been uh, training pigs to do the same thing. It was the other way around. Oh, wasn't it? Pigs first. Oh, pigs so first. They, I they couldn't haul them away yeah, as yeah. quickly as the dog. Right, right. They trained the dog. Right. And, and of course, uh, we're looking at the dogs and because of their uh, uh, sensory uh, abilities now to be early detectors uh, of, uh, of uh, cancer in patients as well, things like that. Of, uh, uh, but that's a little bit of a, a, of a segue from where we want to uh, uh, we want to stay on target here, and uh, so we're going to we're going to uh, move to the uh, to the topic about uh, exposures. Okay, so we've done a little bit about uh, looking at uh, at the perceptions and what contributes to, to these misperceptions. We talked a little bit about uh, what are the uh, perceived health effects and what are the real health effects. And now we want to talk about uh, exposures, and where do, where are people really exposed to mold? Okay. So you heard earlier that 99% of the um, mold problems are of an allergic nature. Here's the rest of the 99% of exposure occurs outdoors, and this is a fancy outdoor air sampler to collect uh, pollen and uh, mold, mold spores during the day, forever, and, uh, and, and yes, and so in this one here, this is the uh, National Allergy Bureau scale, and uh, I'll let Jim talk to it because this is his, that's his machine in, incidentally on top of the hospital. <laughs> well, actually, it's the Academy okay. machine <laughs> that they loan me to okay. give, give us the count kind right. of thing, yeah. So, um, Basically, mold can be around all year long. Uh, even in the winter time, uh, there will be a handful of days when there are no mold spores. No, we're not talking very many, yeah. but they just hang out there. Um, and it takes a lot of mold spores per cubic meter of air to be considered, oh, this is high, yep. or this is very high, <laughs> unlike the pollen. Mm -hmm. which have a much different um, mm -hmm. level. So, yeah, so what we want to, the point of this uh, quickly is just to say that, uh, uh, that you, it's not uncommon uh, to find, uh, uh, you know, 13,000 uh, mold spores per cubic meter of air. It's, it's not uncommon to, to, uh, to find high levels. And Jim will tell you that there are many days when uh, he's doing counts, uh, I, um, and, and uh, finds that, you know, you'll get 50,000 spores per cubic meter of air. And this becomes relevant because as we get a little bit later, we're saying, okay, we're using this as our benchmark. And uh, we run into problems when, when we're using a, a floating standard, let's just say. Well, just, just for comparison, if I enumerated 500 
ragweed pollen in a 24-hour period. That's hardly any mold at all, mm. by comparison. Mm. Yeah. In terms of a a a allergenic. Yeah. Zero, yeah, the number of stuff up there, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Jim just wants to mention that when he does his counts, this is what he usually finds. Okay. Now, these are spores, remember, spores of various fungi. Ascospores, virtually morels, which is our truffles that, that come from that group. Basidial spores, mushrooms, puffballs, cladospore emulsionaria are what we commonly call molds. They really don't know what to call them. Uh, they keep changing the names. They used to be Duramyces long ago. Well, okay, well, whenever you guys decide, we're just going to call it mold for right now. Thank you very much. PA stands for penicillium slash aspergillus. Uh, morphologically, we can't distinguish where we group them together. That's one type. Uh, and then rust and spot sort of thing, you know, when we get to harvest time in the fall, that's when we get lots of them. Right. So so what we want to, what we want to say about this is that, uh, uh, and of course, what we do when we look at this or when Jim looks at it, uh, the, almost always the big, the big one, we're finding at least around here at Cladosporium, uh, is, the, is, the big, is the big family that, uh, that he sees most of. A single family. Right. Don't forget. Yeah. And but uh, you can also get the same amount of ascospores and basidial spores as well. So what? And uh, so so this is this is as Jim says, most of our exposure is outdoors. This is a if you're, uh, you can't avoid it. This is it's, uh, molds are in the fresh air, uh, and in the indoor environment, uh, what we find is that uh, is that we find the same types of molds uh, very often, but not always, and that's the point. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about, uh, coming back then, talk about the indoor environment. We're switching gears here to talk a little bit about the indoor environment. We're coming back again to the toxic, the scary toxic black mold that everybody referred to, which is Stachybotrys. And I've taken this from the Canadian Journal of Medical Microbiology in 26. that looked at the prevalence of Stachybotrys in 200 homes that had water uh, damage. And essentially, uh, they found that, that Stachybotrys was... Uh, found on, uh, commonly found on, on uh, water damaged building materials, that it was detected in wall cavities, but it did not significantly, significantly contribute to spores in room air. In other words, the, uh, uh, the impact on the uh, living space uh, was uh, low, if not negligible, uh, from, the, uh, from the contamination of wall cavity. And uh, this next slide here, uh, just to emphasize, uh, uh, is, a, is a study that uh, we, we are working on. Uh, actually, we, uh, it's embargoed at the moment, meaning that uh, we can't say entirely about this study. Uh, we can't give you the results. Yeah, we can't because we're presenting it next Not for another month. The, uh, at the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. But this is a study in which, uh, in which we uh, uh, used an exposure chamber and on the upper left corner, you'll see that we uh, installed a, um, uh, um, a drywall, um, a wall board made out of drywall and a wood frame, timber frame, typical of a home. And uh, so uh, uh, that's on the upper left. On the bottom uh, left is the back side of that uh, drywall. And, uh, uh, and then you can also see a, a side view that shows it's just a typical timber frame uh, type drywall construction. And what we did is that uh, we um, essentially inoculated mold into the wall cavity and created a couple of different scenarios uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, make mold happy and grow. And then we, uh, we monitored the release of mold spores. And, uh, uh, and essentially, uh, and you can even see it if you look at the upper or the figures on the uh, on the left that you can actually see the water, the water uh, uh, creeping up the uh, drywall. And so we looked at a couple of different scenarios. We we populated, uh, as I said, we grew the molds. They were really nice and happy. And what we found uh, is uh, is that uh, um, that um, there was uh, in some cases, even though we could see a huge amount of mold on the on the backside, it wasn't necessarily First of all, it, it, it wasn't uh, transferred to the to the uh, to the uh, to the living room uh, to the occupied space, uh, meaning that that uh, occupants wouldn't be exposed. Uh, but uh, but also we uh, we often found that with under the right uh, conditions that even though the the mold were were very uh, 
um, thick on the back side, but they still did not release uh, spores into the air. We even found this, uh, incidentally, when we continued this experiment further, uh, where we got all kinds of hairy growth on the front. It didn't necessarily translate into, uh, into spores, and it, which means it didn't translate into human exposure. Okay, that, and that's an important point because, again, we want to talk a little bit about sampling, okay? So uh, we're going to move uh, here into the, yeah, into the last sec section and talk a little bit about standards and guidelines, okay? Uh, and uh, um, that we want to basically say that there are various guidelines out there uh, that you can uh, refer to, the Center for Disease Control, the New York City Guidelines, OSHA, AI, American Industrial Hygiene Association, the American Conference on Occupational Environmental Medicine. There are a lot of them guidelines. I know that public health units have their own, regional health units have their own guidelines. Not all of them are equal. I want to talk that uh, there are some issues around some of those guidelines, and we're not going to speak to them specifically, but I will talk to them uh, generally. Uh, and here's a simple excerpt from the uh, CDC, uh, Molds in the Environment. Uh, and they kind of reiterate what this presentation says, which molds are found uh, in virtually every environment can be detected indoors and outdoors. Some people are sensitive, and this is what we call allergy. Uh, um, the, the allergy is the most, uh, um, again, the third point, that it's the most uh, common uh, um, effect from uh, exposure. Uh, standards for judging what is an acceptable, tolerable, or normal quantity have not been established. Um, consult a, a CDC advises you consult a general health provider. Um, again, referring to the allergists because they're the people who seem to know the most about uh, their allergies. And uh, um, New York City guideline, um, just to highlight, it's not possible to de determine safe or unsafe levels of exposure for the general public because of variation of individual susceptibility, lack of standardization, and validated environmental exposure sampling methods, and lack of reliable biological markers. I'm, uh, the rest of this is here for you to read. I'm not going to uh, go into it in any detail. You can refer to it again later on. I, uh, the o OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, deals with work environments. Uh, and uh, um, they um, say that there are currently no federal standards or recommendations for airborne concentration a mold or mold spores. A long and short is what do they say then in those cases uh, is for uh, information, consult your health practitioner or your local health department. Of course, that throws, and we can understand then the, 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 uh, the grief that this causes for you. And we do emphasize that, uh, that uh, this creates, uh, you know, uh, some uh, degree of uh, a challenge for you in dealing with these different kinds of issues and questions. Uh, we're getting close to the wrap up, so I'll just go through this one uh, specifically, and, want to, and I want to talk about sampling uh, and why, uh, as I say, why sampling is sometimes a problem. And I, I give you a hint of that um, just a moment ago when I talked about our little study there in which we were, uh, we were growing uh, molds and very well and finding uh, that the spores, uh, some uh, spores weren't necessarily being released into the into the uh, into the breathing air, so people weren't being exposed. Uh, so a couple of points I want to talk about in terms of the sampling, and when when people uh, use sampling, it has to be um, it has to be uh, uh, you know carefully thought about. First thing is that we when we do sampling, we often use fresh outdoor air as our comparator because there is no other. Uh, there's no other standard, right? Um, we don't have, unlike chemicals, we can't say that 20 ppm uh, of this uh, chemical uh, will, will uh, you know, we, we've chosen as, a, as, our, as our target uh, to prevent uh, ill health. Uh, so we say, well, if people can tolerate fresh air, uh, then, then that's what we use as our, as our comparator. And there's many standards that are based on using fresh air as your reference value. The problem with that is, that uh, the values can range uh, from from basically zero to you know uh, something in the order of 100,000, 200,000 in fresh air, okay, in outdoor air. 
So when your when your guideline or your background or your reference that you're comparing changes that much, it causes it causes us to pause. Uh, second point uh, that I want to make in terms of uh, this is is uh, is actually uh, sampling. Normally, when we talk about sampling, we talk about being able to repeat a sample and get the same result. So if I put a sampler on an individual uh, and I measure their uh, exposure to a chemical. Uh, I'd like to know that uh, if I put two samplers on that person, they would give me the same result. Or if I monitored that, uh, you know, the same scenario the next day, that they would virtually give me pr pretty much the same thing. Well, it, it's not true, not in the case of mold spores. Uh, Jim and I did a study, which we published a few years ago. We used four different samplers. We operated them simultaneously, and we did five consecutive measurements. Uh, each session. So we basically got 20 measurements, uh, one right after the other. And we can tell you that there's a 100% difference. You can expect a 100% difference uh, from time to time when you do those kinds of measurements, okay? So this is something else to keep in mind, is the variability around, uh, around uh, sampling. The other, the, as I mentioned, so the other uh, point that I want to refer to is the benchmark. As I mentioned, we often use uh, three times three times outdoor concentration as our indicator of whether or not. This is a rule of thumb as an indicator of whether or not uh, a home, let's say, might be contaminated. Well, the problem with that is that uh, three times uh, really uh, is an indication that, yeah, the two numbers are statistically different. You can say that, yeah, this sample and this sample, probably I would say that they're not the same. There's something different about the two of them. But you can't assign anything meaningful to that kind of increase, not in the context of some of the variability that, that we see. And in particular, what I want to mention is that it very much depends on uh, the season or the time frame. So in other words, if you, if you test your home today, uh, or this environment today and say, um, I found uh, 500 uh, spores per cubic meter of, in, in the air. Uh, and uh, so I compare it to the outdoor air, and Jim tells me, well, uh, the outdoor air at the summertime has got 15,000. Okay, well, no big deal. Um, I come back in the wintertime, I find 500 spores per cubic meter of air. When Jim gives me the reading, he says, there's nothing in the air outside. Am I supposed to, well, that's more than three times outdoor. But this is the kind of rule of thumb that we use. And what I'm saying is that there has to be some judgment around assigning rules uh, and these, applying these rules of thumb. Um, another point I, I mentioned, and this comes from, from, from uh, doing sampling, is that uh, when we measure uh, the number of spores per cubic meter of air, it doesn't necessarily mean that it reflects the actual conditions. And uh, just referring back to that uh, exposure chamber study that we did, uh, I can tell you that uh, we, we uh, had times when uh, we could see ex extreme growth of mold uh, and yet nothing in the air. So this doesn't necessarily mean because you measured and uh, you had a, a, a guideline that, uh, and you didn't find any mold in the air, that that necessarily reflects uh, well either. And so, so we're looking at the reverse situation here. Um, there's, and in some of the some of the staffing guidelines, you'll see a reference to not only uh, uh, monitoring for total mold spores, but monitoring for viable mold spores. And this refers to sampling methodology. Uh, one of the problems, and again, I, I, sorry, because we, we're only going to have limited time, but, but uh, uh, it, the question becomes then, okay, well, what are you collected on? Um, so, some molds are very selective, and, and uh, you uh, try to collect it on the uh, uh, general, uh, you think it's a, the proper media, and it may be that, uh, that uh, uh, nothing's going to grow because that mold doesn't like that, uh, that particular media. So, and you won't know that uh, cause you, you, until you've actually collected the sample, right? Uh, so um, 
The problem, uh, there's a problem then uh, in trying to assign numerical exposure limits, that is, in, uh, trying, because uh, unlike, uh, um, uh, unlike chemicals, um, we don't know what the relationship is uh, of the number of spores to the level of risk, right? There's no dose effect. And uh, um, what, I, what I do want to say about that is that uh, when we do assign numerical limits, we're uh, generally what we're trying to do is protect most of the people most of the time. And here we're dealing with an aller allergy situation. And allergy by definition means that we're dealing with uh, somebody who's sensitive and they're not, <laughs> you know. So, Everybody so, has different sensitivity. Right. It's so, like the rag wheat. So. Right. Uh, and and f so finally, uh, in terms of um, uh, destructive or invasive testing, there are some guidelines uh, out there that say you should pu uh, punch holes in walls and look behind cavities and so on. Um, and, and what we, uh, we can tell you is that sometimes that's excessive, uh, especially if there's other evidence lacking. So it, it, this all comes back to using some professional judgment around uh, and the application of uh, sampling principles. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, we did start wrapping up. Yeah, this is, this is actually our second last one. I don't know if you want to speak to it, Jim, at all or not. This well, very quickly, this is an example of outdoor air. In the usual situation, back in 2012, they had the severe drought in the Midwest. Um, I do low counts for Dr. Ford in Omaha. And um, so the corn started to grow, then it died. They had this big rainfall, and then it became just black. And then they harvested it, and uh, there was a huge spike of clouds for him in Alton area. I mean, more than 100,000. I said, thank you, but I don't like doing all these big counts. Because it took quite a while, but it was just like over two-week period, the last one on the art. And that just shows you that well, and, and what, what we, it's what, amazing sometimes, but it's Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, Possible, yes. part of the reason we wanted to throw this in here, just again to shake things up a bit, we often associate these issues around, uh, uh, you know, humidity, moisture problems, uh, in, uh, inadequate housing, and so on. And and that's true. But the, what, the reason we throw this in here is just because it's the reverse of what we expect to find. And again, such enormous. My Alton area and Dr. Ford got home and said, "What's going on here? Okay. All our Alton area patients are going nuts." And I said, "No." Right. So, yeah. so uh, the, what, what do we want to say about this whole thing? There's really no mystery about mold. Uh, mold is just a part of life. And one last thing to leave you with. Uh, I don't know if you can read that cheesy Valentine card, let's grow mold together. <laughs> and actually, mold can be good for fun because we eat a lot of stuff derived from mold, not just the truffle. With that, we're going to wrap up, and I don't know if we have any... I think we have time for just a couple of questions. Okay. There's, there's one from Hastings, Prince Edward County. Okay. Um, and it says, when advising a client on cleaning mold, is a good practice to use hot water and soap? I would say yes. And I would say find the source of the water and turn that off. That's the main thing. Yeah. Uh, and then from, uh, from York Region, um, for the reasons you've explained, um, they don't recommend sampling. However, if a client has a consultant sampling report, um, York Public Region, uh, they, they do review it and look for things uh, such as indoor versus outdoor levels. Should we not be looking at these reports given that these rules of sampling can fail? Um, I think the answer is the people who do the sampling should be able to interpret the results and use their best judgment. And that's what, that's what we do. And we talk about this on each individual case. There's a significant, non-significant. But often, it, if you see them all, well, you know there's a problem, get rid of the moisture. One, you know, one of the other I, things that I like is your, your final remark, which says that we do look at other factors such as visual observations and moisture and structural issues. That's bang on. That's yes. what you have to do. Yes. That's great to hear. Yes. That's the most important thing. And Turn off the water. And this is very common for inspectors where um, we, we get complaints um, from the public that somebody's renting a basement apartment. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the basement of an apartment building um, where they may have runoff that slopes towards the building. Yes. And it's common to have basement floods, as Rakesh points out, yes. um, and it results in mold growth. 
And the result of that, he's saying, is that the tenant wants to file an insurance claim um, but wants the public health inspector to have input with respect to health concerns. Um, and then Rakesh's question is, are we safe to say no um, adverse health effects other than allergies? I would say more worried about the building. But the mold is trying to eat the building, right? That's the main thing. You, you have to have the health effect main one there. And, and in general, you, know, if you want to live where it's, where it's all damp and moldy and stuff like that? No. There's an astute question that just came in from Toronto Public Health, um, and it's, do you believe public health units should issue health hazard orders for mold? What do you mean by health hazard? I orders? Think, I, I think we've explained that the circumstances where you're going to be having a problem with mold. Can, can, I, can I ask, under what conditions would you do that? They're typing yes. response down at the bottom. Okay. Okay. And I think this speaks well that questions are being formulated to the discussion we were having before the uh, seminar started was that some public health units um, will investigate mold complaints um, and others will not refer those to uh, municipal property standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this, this question is kind of getting at maybe some of the differences between the health units and whether or not we should be following up on um, those mold complaints and then as a result, uh, I think that health hazard question is one that is very interesting. Yeah. It, what, okay. what, we, what we have found uh, just, uh, in, in, um, I think at, at least where, where we're at, uh, is that, uh, that it's, it's a very circular kind of a relationship and we've seen that the public, uh, that the public health unit has been, uh, has been brought in where the city property standards people don't feel that they ha they're sufficiently informed, so they want to defer to the public health unit, and it's like kind of the box. It's, uh, it's kind of in the, in the reverse. Uh, so I think it probably goes both ways. What Thunder Bay is talking about here, the last yeah. comment is just the, the definition from the um, from the Health Protection Promotion Act of yeah. health hazard. Right. Um, that there there's an expected to be an adverse health uh, adverse health effect. Um, in a member of the general public. Mm -hmm. um, and the, Sorry, say that again? It's, it, it's um, it, an expectation to have an adverse mm -hmm. health effect on a member of the public. And mm -hmm. this is where some of the differences come on between the, the oh, different health units. Mm -hmm. Exactly, okay. the interpretation of that, yeah. Yeah. Where, um, where some health units will say, well, the expectation is that if it's occurring in a basement apartment, that that's not public space. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where some health units kind of back off from that. Yes. If this is occurring in a public space, like say a, a shopping mall or yeah. a hospital or something like that, that's, that's more clearly defined as public. But um, the, the home environment um, is, is where we find some variation. Mm -hmm. um, and Daphne's got a, a question here from First Nations Health Authority. Are there any studies on the psychological effects of mold? And that, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Well, only on the misperception, I'd say. Daphne, I don't, I don't have an answer to that uh, myself. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a very uh, interesting question, uh, and, uh, um, and of course, I think it relates to not just mold, but probably mold in the context of other uh, housing issues, and it's probably more well, complex true. in how to, yeah. how to kind of separate they have to go together, uh, yeah. separate issues. I'm not sure how they would do that. I haven't looked. Uh, at that literature, uh, and, I, and so I, I don't honestly know, but it, it's certainly a, a very interesting uh, point that you raise. Okay, I think that we do need to sort of wrap things up there, so I, I'd like to thank uh, Peter and Jim for their, their time and uh, coming down to Public Health Ontario here and putting together their presentation. Um, for those of you that missed the, the introduction to the presentation due to our technical problems, um, we, are, we are recording the presentation. Um, it will be posted to the Sci-Fi YouTube channel, um, as well as it will appear shortly on the Sci-Fi Ontario website under Knowledge Resources. Um, and just before I go, I'd like to, to add uh, that it's that time of year for members to renew their membership, um, complete their professional development hours for the CPC, 